Good afternoon. My name is Olivia Zink and I'm the Executive Director for Open Democracy. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we welcome you to this special day to celebrate Granny D, our organizational founder, but I really invite you today to feel inspired. We come together to solve the important crisis of our time, our crisis in, of democracy. And we have a power imbalance in our political system and we're working to fix it regardless of our age, gender, race, or party affiliation, big money in our election corrupts our systems, resulting in policies that benefit from big donors at the expense of all of us. Regardless, we, we all know that regardless of age, gender, race, or party affiliation, that big money in our election corrupts the system and results in policies that benefit big donors at the expense of the rest of us. This disproportional influence is what we're fighting back against. And Doris Granny D would not want us to just celebrate her. She would want us to work for solutions. We have a really amazing program um, for you today, um, including stories from her dear friends, as well as um, movement leaders like John Bonifaz and Hedrick Smith. We also have music and, and some slides, but I wanna take a moment to thank our wonderful team who pulled this together. Um, thank you to the Granny D Legacy Committee and the staff at Open Democracy, Brian and Doreen. I really want you to feel invited to um, be inspired and enjoy the wealth of the stories and the program that has to offer. And our founder, Granny D, was part of a study group, um, the Tuesday Academy, which examined different topics. And one of her friends said to her when talking about campaign finance reform, what are you going to do about it? And I want you to reflect, what are you going to do about it? Thank you, and I enjoy the program. I now turn it over to a story by her friend, um, Nancy Brown. And Nancy um, is actually a dear friend of mine who actually introduced me to Granny D. So Nan Nancy Brown from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And um, I'm grateful to be um, at, at, that you're asking me to share some of my um, thoughts and re you know what I remember about the time I spent with Granny D. And um, she was a, a wonderful, she became a friend. And um, she inspired me again and again, and I was with her a number of times walking, um, you know, encouraging people to vote um, in one of the couple different, it went, the one or two things I'll share with you is um, when I had a break from school, I was teaching at that time, high school, and um, just retired recently, and I um, had the winter break, and so I went to Florida. Um, and she was there with her son, and her son was happy that I was there because then I spent a week with her, almost a week. And we went to different places where we were going to register people to vote. And um, so I'm driving the, the big, you know, truck that says, vote, damn it. And um, we're going in different directions, and she's giving me instructions. I can't seem to get any sound here. All these places in Florida, but we had a, a really good time together. And one of the um, interesting events of that time was we set up a couple of tables outside a Walmart, big Walmart place, very popular. People going in and out, as you know, across the country, it's pretty popular. And we set up a table and what we were doing is as people walked by, we'd say, could we speak with you for a minute? Um, have you voted? And you couldn't believe how many people said no. And I would say, we both had agreed what we're going to talk about. I would say, why haven't you voted before? You know, well, why should I? I mean, they don't listen to us or it doesn't matter. And then, you know, Granny D would say all these wonderful things about how important it is. And um, this is a, um, you know, part of our democracy and people have to vote. And can we encourage you to vote? And all we're asking you to do is register. And then if you register, then you find out where you're going to be voting and you can vote. 
this is how you register. So we were doing that with a number of people. And then um, after we were there for about a half an hour, um, somebody came marching out of the door at, from Walmart and he said, look, I'm the manager here and I want to know what you folks are doing. And um, I went, oh my God. And I said, we're, in, um, we're here just talking with people. And he said, well, you shouldn't be here. We don't let people do that. And Sarah Paddock was so incredible. She said, well, let me tell you what we're doing. We are- I can't get any sound. We are not telling them who to vote for. We are talking to them about the importance of voting as part of our democracy. Well, I don't know, we don't do that here. You know, you have to do it someplace else. And she said, I have permission to do that. I called your headquarters. And he said, well, I'm gonna go in and call headquarters and I'll be out. So he went back in the door and I said, well, I don't know, Granny D, if, what, you know, we might have to leave sooner than we thought. So we kept talking with people and it was very insightful. Not that I didn't know that there weren't a number of people. You know, <laughs> well, this is ridiculous. I'll come down and see if I can get it downstairs. At one time in the late 60s and in coal mining camps and the majority of those people, the fathers having black lung disease, they didn't vote. And I, I was just in awe. You know, and this was so important in terms of what was going on in their lives. So we kept registering, you know, Granny D and I kept registering people to vote. And she was so kind to everybody, even if people said, I'm not going to waste my time, I'm not going to vote. And she'd say, just do it, just do it. I, once you start doing it, you, you know, this is very special. Anyway, the man came out in a while and he said, well, he said, I did call headquarters and I guess uh, you did make some kind of phone call there. And so they said, you can be here today, but you can't come back again. And she said, oh, and always kind, just said so to this man, said, that's so kind of you that you did that. And we're so pleased that we can stay here. So, well, just today, and you don't have that much time, maybe another hour or two, you know? So we, she never once, you know, when people were negative would ever snap back, you know, or say anything. And, and, um, even when she was criticized, you know, she, it was a challenge for her. Um, we, anyway, that was one incident and I helped her as, as well as Open Democracy um, did to get her to speak a number of places. Thank you for the story for Nancy. Um, and I wanna introduce our next speaker. John Bonifaz is an attorney and an author. Um, you know, 12 years ago was the anniversary of Citizens United, and John, you know, wrote an amicus brief as part of that case and um, was the co-founder of Spe Free Speech for People and does voting rights um, law as well. So please welcome John. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be with all of you today to celebrate the life of Granny D. Uh, and just a minor correction, my co-founder at Free Speech for People was the co-author or the author of that amicus brief before Citizens United in, in the Supreme Court. That's Jeff Clements. But we did co-found Free Speech for People on the day of the Citizens United ruling in January 2010. And I continue to direct it uh, to this day. When Olivia called me to ask whether I would share some memories of, of Granny D, I, I immediately uh, said yes. She remains in my heart, her spirit has been with me uh, forever since uh, she died. But, you know, 23 years ago is when I first learned about Granny D. A colleague of mine at the National Voting Rights Institute, the nonprofit I was directing at the time, challenging big money in politics, came into my office and told me about this woman, 89 years old, who was walking across the country to overhaul our nation's campaign finance system. She says, you have to check this out. And all of us at the National Voting Institute were inspired by her and what she was setting out to do. Walking through the rain, through the wind, through the snow, cross country skiing in places, 3,200 miles later, 14 months later, turning 90 in the process, she reached Washington, D.C. And I was honored to have been there that day among 
thousands of others to welcome her uh, to Washington, D.C. I, I traveled down to make sure I could witness this amazing woman and her journey arriving in Washington. And I remember seeing her as she crossed that bridge from Arlington into D.C. Uh, and there was Senator Feingold and Senator McCain waiting to greet her along with hundreds of others. And I was in awe, in awe of this inspiring human being who had inspired really at that point millions around the globe for her willingness to stand up and fight for our democracy, to say no to big money in politics, no to corporate interests, uh, and yes to one person, one vote, and the promise of political equality for all. And to be able to march in those remaining uh, steps with her and many others to the nation's capital. She was resolute. She spoke with conviction that day uh, and, and so many other days since then, since I had gotten to know her. Uh, she, she stood up for what she believed in uh, and, and she went to jail uh, for what she believed in. She, she, she got arrested, as we know, months later after that uh, for staging a, a protest in the U.S. Capitol, reading the Declaration of Independence, making clear that it was time to be independent from corporate interests. And, you know, Gran Granny D is somebody whose legacy will, will live on uh, with all of us. And it's important to note that on the day of the Citizens United ruling in January of 2010, she reportedly thought about walking across the country again, outraged by that ruling uh, and the way at which it swept away a century of press and barring corporate money in our elections and sanctioning this corporate takeover of our democracy. Uh, and of course, we lost her two, year, two months later. But, you know, the other point of this is that there was a, a movement that we were proud to be part of starting the day of the Citizens United ruling, calling for a constitutional amendment to overturn that ruling and the doctrines underlying that ruling of money equaling speech, which Granny D spoke out so much against, and corporations being treated as people with constitutional rights. And I've often thought about the fact that when Granny D was born in January of 1910, she saw, she, she was not even uh, yet able uh, to see the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. It came in her lifetime in 1920. She saw nine amendments passed by the United States Congress, ratified by three quarters of the states in her lifetime. And, and in this movement to fight for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and those fabricated doctrines, it's important to remember that change can happen in a lifetime. Uh, and that Granny D represented that kind of hope and, and that kind of change. I, I just will end this by saying that, you know, Granny D's inspiration is, is something we need to hold on to at this moment in time in this existential crisis we face in our democracy. We need to rem remember what it took for her at the age of 88 starting out and then turning 89, 90, walking across the country and gain strength from that. We will miss you, Granny D, but your spirit lives on in all of us. And in your name, we will keep fighting for our democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, next, uh, we'll turn it over to Francis von Merton, who was a dear family friend and a neighbor. If you can unmute. Thank you. I, that was very emotionally touching, John, so I have to recover a little bit. Um, Doris. Haddock, Granny D lived down the road, dear friend, um, family friend, and uh, Granny D to a family that we continue to be close with. At the annual Granny D lunches, 
I've told a few stories and also the summertime walk, the memorial or uh, walk honoring her each summer from Dublin to downtown Peterborough. I've told some stories from my time walking with her Las Cruces to El Paso or through El Paso, but this one is about Doris at home. I remember a visit with her after our walk. How's that book you're working on, she asked. Tell me about it. Don't let it sit in your desk too long. She'd give me a pep talk with real interest in me, remembering the book in my desk drawer. Nothing about her, still very active in her work for campaign finance reform. She could have spent our visit talking about Bill Moyers, Igwigs in DC, McCain-Feingold, her books. A few years later, she was older, well into her 90s, age had caught up with her. She'd moved to live with Jim and Libby, her son and daughter-in-law next door. And Jim had fixed up, um, rehabbed a space, a living space for her in, in their house. And Carol Wyndham, I see Carol Wyndham's face right there, <laughs> who uh, a dear friend of Doris's and also a, a real um, compatriot in uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, well, she, she would arrange um, company for Doris, um, who was pretty much at home, um, needed some assistance. So she loves, uh, Doris loves Scrabble and I was um, <laughs> to play Scrabble with Doris. And on my assigned day, we sat down in her small kitchen table and her small kitchen eating area. And while the Scrabble gods were with me, almost, um, I exaggerate, but I love hyperbole, almost spelling out these big words with X and Z and Q um, on my tray of small tiles. Each turn I, I scored hugely to the point of feeling embarrassed and, and uh, uncomfortable. Poor Doris was getting royally beat and I was supposed to be good company for her. I'd be miffed if I was her and a little bit pouty, although I'd pretend to be a good sport and I, I do that in lots of situations, but not Doris. She got so excited for me that she couldn't sit still. And this is again, um, she's, um, so she was standing up cheering me. She could not sit still. She got so excited she would stand up all five feet of her, which meant that we were kind of eye level and she'd be just cheering uh, me, um, unable to contain her excitement. So think about that. When was the last time you got so excited about anything that you just had to stand up? And uh, I've watched our grandchildren do that age of excitement where they, <gasps> and to stand up and scrunch fingers and couldn't, so excited they'd have to run someplace and, and not walk. And um, we, uh, I've also watched them grow out of that and become normal adults, um, not Doris. And um, now and again over the years, I think, well, what would Doris do? And pro possibly when I'm a little pouty, like poor me. So I saw that walking with her really no separation between her every day. So many stories about her encounters with people and such a diversity of people and separation is, is the sin. Um, you can look at it that way. And, and uh, we're so separate. It's and increasingly now, unfortunately, and there was no separation um, between Doris and, and uh, people um, she encountered and she also was obviously focused on the cause. And most of us, when we get excited and passionate about a cause, the cause is almost between us and people. And that wasn't the case with Doris. And I think that's in large part why she was so successful. Um, she also, as a granny day, um, she had a cell phone and a cell phone. It was the early days of cell phone and this little magic thing um, that we would pass around trying to arrange TV or radio interviews or with groups and towns that we were approaching. Um, so she'd use, of course, her cell phone to call her grandchildren and she's so involved in their lives. And I could hear those conversations with her. So she was Granny D um, to a fair number of grandchildren. 
So I am going to tell one story that I've told before. When I said that she encountered a diversity of people on her walks, um, this is about one uh, very diverse person, um, a radio shock jock in El Paso. Early one morning, um, we were a small band at that time of su a support group, and we were approaching El Paso. A radio TV with call letters on it drove up. Hop in, a fellow said. We want you on our, our um, Good Morning El Paso um, show. Well, in she hopped, uh, along with a fellow, a young fellow from Chicago who had heard about um, Granny D got on a bus and somehow found um, Granny D along the way and, and he stayed with her for a good long time. As the van drove, up, drove off, a bystander said, we just put her in the hands of the local shock jock, the Howard Stern of El Paso. And we were dismayed at our failure to take care of Granny D. When she was delivered back to us, the first one out of the van was the young man from Chicago. How did she do? We asked, fearful. Two thumbs up. He said, she kicked butt. So the shock jock fellow had tried to divert her from her message, asking her how many shoes she'd worn out, um, belly aching about his um, sore knees, out of shape. Um, Doris said that what's important isn't how many shoes she's worn out, or sore knees, or her emphysema. She didn't mention that. Um, she'd have an inhaler. Um, what's important is democracy with a capital D, what's right for we the people. And as you all know, we the people, the first words of the constitution, that was, that was her, her chorus always, uh, we the people. She loved that phrase. When the fellow went on and on about his aches and pains, Doris at one point said, oh, you poor, poor dear. And with that, there was laughter from the background staff. Um, um, and during, we, the young man told us later on that during the commercial breaks to any typical whining comment by the shock jock, his staff would respond, oh, you poor, poor dear. So, um, I don't know if my thing about separation between Doris and other people really applies here, but it's just she could handle herself in with a diversity of people and a diversity of, of situations. So I was like John, I was uh, there in DC when she arrived. I carried a big Granny D for president sign through two airports and a train. And then in DC, among the crowds who fell in line behind her, she passed by. And I wore this t-shirt um, that I, I got back to uh, Peterborough um, and I thought, oh, I know how uh, I can, I know how she can finance her, her walk. So I had a whole bunch of these uh, made up and it says on the top, Granny D, Los Angeles to Washington. Here's the map of her footsteps, her hat, her flag, and probably her fifth pair of shoes campaign finance reform, on the road, see you in Washington, January 24th, the year 2000. And on the front it said, go granny, go. And it had her website address. So Doris being Doris, did she sell the t-shirts to fund her way? No, she gave them away. So that's another, <laughs> I should have known. Um, approaching the Capitol building, we were told we had to put our signs down. Um, and a security precaution, signs on sticks being a potential weapon perhaps we'd whack people with. And in the context of today, I mean, we can laugh about that, but you know, we couldn't have our signs. Um, and then when, when her speech was over and the McCain and Feingold talk, we found out that our signs were gone and I, I was, I still miss that sign. I wanted to carry it through more airports, train Granny D for president. And I would love to have it on framed on my wall, um, honoring Granny D. 
or Doris Haddock. I can't say it the way she did with her crisp enunciation. Haddock like the fish, she'd often say. Have you all heard her say that? Haddock like the fish. So happy birthday, Doris Haddock like the fish, Granny D. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hedrick Smith. He is an author, um, a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning documentary film, and a former New York Times journalist. Thank you, Hedrick. Well, I got to tell you, Olivia, it's just wonderful to be with you. Uh, I wish I were up there in New Hampshire. I know it's cold. I know you got snow. Uh, I miss it. Um, and it's just wonderful to connect and to hear the stories. Uh, just listening to those stories about Granny D. Um, two or three things come across immediately. Electricity. I mean, she had an electricity about her that just shot power out and into other people. Tenacity. Never gave up. Never gave up. And connection. She could connect with anybody. The guy in the Walmart store, the shock jock in El Paso, it doesn't matter. Uh, she was able to connect with all of them. Sadly, I never got to meet Granny D, uh, but I feel a special connection to her because she was born the same year as my mother, 1910. So I have a sort of a feeling of connection with that generation. But I needed to get a Granny D fix when Olivia called me and asked me to take part today. So I asked her to send me the book that uh, Olivia and others put together about Granny D and her speeches and her travels. And I was struck by the title, The Politics of Joy. But you know, listening to you all, it's really the joy of politics. She, she enjoyed politics. It didn't intimidate her, it invited her. Uh, and she lights a fire. It's amazing when you think about it. I mean, she's gone, I never met her, but I feel the fire from Granny D myself, you know, down here in DC where we need a lot of fire, that's for sure. I think there are a few things about Granny D that are really fundamental that um, are easy to get lost in the particulars of reform, McCain Feingold or campaign finance. She reminded us all, and that walk symbolizes it, power in a democracy begins at the grassroots. Power begins at the grassroots. It starts with us. We have to remember that. We have to make sure that the people in power who supposedly serve us remember it too. And then in her own individual way, he, she was telling us and showing us each of us can make a difference. No matter how small, no matter how individual, no matter how lonely or how isolated, as Francie just put it, each of us has the power to make a difference. And then there's a wonderful quote in her book, and there are a zillion of them, of course, but there's a wonderful quote somewhere in the middle of her book when she talks about a great sense of fairness is the genius of America's aspiration. A great sense of fairness. Well, I have to tell you, if Granny D came back to us today, she would be appalled. She would be outraged. We are living through a period in which the politicians are simply trashing a great sense of fairness. I mean, the tribal warfare which is essentially drowning our sense of shared hope and shared destiny, which is what she was embodying, not only talking about. Um, you know, she fought to control big money. And just before she died, the amount of dark money, the money you can't trace in political campaigns was $8 million a year. The last campaign, $1.5 billion. I mean, if she came back to that, she would be up in arms. She would be in the face of that Walmart uh, guy uh, and the board of Walmart and, and all of us to do something about it. The gerrymandering. I mean, it's just unbelievable what's going on. And uh, most of my colleagues in the media are busy talking about whether or not the Republicans are going to gain seats in Arizona and North Carolina and Texas and Georgia and Florida and so forth, and if the Democrats are going to gain seats in Illinois and in New York. What we all have to understand is they can play to a draw. The people who lose are us, the voters, because both sides 
the reds are making red districts redder and the blues are making blue districts bluer. And what that means is there aren't competitive districts. And what that means is our votes don't count. The general election doesn't matter as much. And you're running into it right now in New Hampshire uh, with the recent gerrymandering by your legislature of the districts uh, up there, uh, trying to tilt this and say, fine, we'll give the Democrats one, but we, the Republicans, want one. The point is, does your vote count? Can you make a difference? If a district is won 52-48 or better, 50.2% and 49.8%, it's great. Democracy is working like crazy because every vote counts. They have to worry about everybody. They have to get out there and campaign. They have to pay attention to us. So we have to stay engaged. Now, voting, that's the big issue today. First of all, we need to stop and actually celebrate something about American voting. 2020 was not only an honest, straight, fair election, it was a boom election. 158 million Americans voted, highest percentage of Americans voting since 1908. And 101 million of them, 101 million Americans voted either by mail or voted early. So what happens to the guys who are afraid of losing? They say, oh, no, we're clamped down on mail voting. We'll clamp down on early voting. We'll make it harder, right? In a way, what you've got from the, the legislatures that are rolling out these restrictive voting laws is panic, is fear, fear that they'll lose power if they let the elections run straight, which means we need to stay engaged. Now, on voting, there are three things that we need to pay attention to. First of all, there's access to the vote. Can you vote? Can you vote by mail? Can you vote early? Do you have to vote in person? Do you have to have an ID? Are there mailboxes where you can drop off your mail vote? That kind of stuff. Access to the vote. And that is a big, hot issue. And you heard, I'm not going to repeat it too many more times, you know, in 19 states, there are 34 laws that have restricted one way or another. Fewer mailboxes, tougher ID in order to get an absentee ballot. It doesn't get sent out uh, automatically and so forth. And we've got to fight that. Secondly, there's the counting of the vote and not enough attention is being paid to what's going on there. There are today 15 Republicans who openly declare the Trump big lie that the 2020 election was stolen and they are running for secretary of state in 15 different states. Take the state of Georgia. I think a lot of us forget, we tend to think, well, the Democrats are really for reform, the Democrats are really for fair votes. Let me tell you, in 2020, it was constitutional Republicans who saved our republic. In Georgia, it was Brad Raffensperger, the Republican Secretary of State, who had count and recount and recount and was on the phone with Donald Trump on January 2nd. And Trump said, find me 11,780 more votes so I can take Georgia. And he said, they're not there, Mr. President. The Republican governor of Georgia certified Biden's victory. In Arizona, it was the Republican supervisors in Maricopa County who refused to bend to pressures from Rudy Giuliani and others in the Trump entourage. It was the Republican Attorney General, Jeffrey Clark, who refused to bend. And in the end, it was the Republican Vice President, Mike Pence, who stood up against Trump's pressure on January 6th, before January 6th, and to the mob that had hang, hang Mike Pence um, uh, signs out and were singing chants about hanging Mike Pence. So just remember that it has been a bipartisan commitment to the Constitution that has saved us. But counting that vote, is as important as having access to the vote. And then finally, there is certifying the vote. So there's voting, there's counting the vote, and there's certifying the vote. All three of those things have to work. Now, there's just been a failure on the issue of getting greater access to the vote, but no reason to give up. There is a willingness on the part of some Republicans and Angus King, the independent senator from Maine and others, to try to fix the certification and the counting of the vote by updating the 1887 electoral vote count. Not unimportant. If you can start there, if you can start to build those bridges, 
it's absolutely critical that we tell our representatives in Congress that you must do that. And, you know, if you're working on that, you might just slip a few of the provisions, um, you know, from the Freedom to Vote Act or the John Lewis uh, uh, Voting Rights Act into this package. There is some willingness on both sides to deal with this, but quietly and not in a partisan way. So that's a very important thing that can be done in Washington and needs to be built on. And in each state, there has to be a fight at the state level on the issues of access to the vote and fighting gerrymandering. It's easy at the moment to get disheartened, to get disheartened, to think, well, it's impossible. Uh, the folks who are rigging elections, stacking districts, making it harder to vote, they're gonna prevail. It's only going to happen if the rest of us give up, give up on Granny D in the example that Granny D set. Remember, power in a democracy starts at the grassroots from the bottom up, and each one of us can make a difference. Well, you say, how? All these fights are going on in Washington. They're going on in the state legislature. Well, in most towns and most counties, the people who count the votes and make sure that the vote counts are locally elected. They're either elected directly by you or you elect the mayor or the county supervisors and they pick the election officials. Those local elections matter for the integrity of the vote and the example that New Hampshire sets for the rest of the country because you still are the first primary in the country. You do set an example. And so I think that we've got to get back to Granny D's spirit. It's a time when COVID has discouraged people, people feel isolated, as Francie was saying, but it's a time to reconnect and reconnecting at the local level on local politics and then pushing your representatives. You've got two great senators uh, from New Hampshire. Um, you've got good people in Congress. Let them know this is a time not to despair. This is a time to keep trying to reach across the aisle and try to get something done. Find out where the the common elements between constitutional folks and the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and by the way, among independents who are the largest body of voters in America today, larger than either of the other two. So I'm back to Granny D and the example that she set. Uh, wonderful stories. I wish I'd been there in Washington with John, uh, greeting Granny D after that unbelievable 3,200 mile walk. Or I'd love to have been there <laughs> when he, when she was doing that interview with the shock jock and El Paso and Francia and, and laughing at the guy feeling sorry for himself. But the wonderful thing about her is obviously she never did. We shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves. She set an example for us and she said the politics of joy, but I think it's the joy of politics. Granny D's out there. She lights a fire. It's up to us to pick up the flame and keep going. Thank you so much. And, and it's absolutely true. We have to you know, do democracy every day, as Doris often says. Our next speaker is um, the photographer of Granny D, who followed her around with a camera, Pat Water John. That was a fabulous speech. Thank you so much. That was just so wonderful and inspiring. <clears throat> so Doris was a very special and dear friend of mine. And one of the amazing things about her is that she was a very special and dear friend to countless other people. She was a listener extraordinaire and the most personally political person I've ever known. I'd like to share with you about one and a half weeks of Doris's life in the fall of 2007 when she was 97 years old. On a Wednesday morning, I was getting ready to drive to New Hampshire to pick up Doris, to go to the Manchester airport, to drive to Iowa, to give a talk at a college. She called me early that morning and said, Pat, do you have a pair of sunglasses I can borrow? She said she'd fallen that night on her oxygen tank and had a shiner. She, I asked her if she was sure she wanted to go. She said, yes, of course. She didn't want to let the students down. When I picked her up, she looked terrible. Her eye was black and her cheek was getting colorful. I asked again, was she sure she wanted to go? Yes, yes, of course, give me the glasses and let's go. So we got to the college in Iowa. First, she met with a student group. 
Then she was interviewed by uh, the college radio station. Then she spoke to the entire student body, faculty, and in administration in a large auditorium. When we left the motel early the next day at dawn, <clears throat> I returned her to her home that Thursday afternoon. And on Friday, Carol Wyndham, hello, Carol, um, picked her up to fly to Texas for a documentary film festival where on Sunday, a film about Granny D won the Audience Choice Award. They flew back to New Hampshire on Monday or Tuesday. I had a meeting with Doris Wednesday afternoon so she could look through a collection of photos I had taken of her for a presentation that we would give on Sunday at the Griffin Museum of Photography in Winchester. We planned to run through the photos on Doris's computer so she could plan her commentary to match the photos. But on Tuesday night, Doris's son, Jim, called me saying that Doris was not doing well. His wife, Libby, had called him at work that afternoon telling him to come right home. She couldn't wake Doris. That evening, Doris was still unresponsive. So Jim checked her appointment book, saw that Doris and I were supposed to meet at noon the next day, and called me to describe her situation and tell me that she and I would not meet and that he would let me know the next day how she was doing. I worried about her all night, and at around 11 the next morning, when I planned to leave for her house, the phone rang. I answered with trepidation. I heard Doris's voice saying, good morning, Pat. I'm just calling to see if I collected some eggs from our chickens, if you'd like a nice egg salad sandwich before we work on the presentation. <laughs> so up to New Hampshire I went, but when we started to work on the photos, her computer wasn't working. I'll skip the adventure of getting her computer fixed, but in the middle of that, someone working on a New Hampshire public financing bill with her called and yelled at Doris, angry that she had agreed to a compromise on this bill. Doris explained to her that she'd spoken to everyone in government involved with this bill and the compromise was the best, this compromise was the best that they could do now. They would try for a better one next year. Then another person angry with Doris's compromise called. I wanted to take the phone and say, do you know this woman was at death's door yesterday? Give her a break. But Doris didn't need my protection. She handled every call with compassion, patience, and grace. Doris decided she would hire a facilitator to help them all talk it out on a, in a meeting on Saturday. On Saturday, she held her meeting and on Sunday, Carol Wyndham drove her to my house and then we went to the Griffin Museum where Doris gave a beautiful talk, earning another standing ovation. And that was just one and a half weeks in the life of Doris at the age of 97 years old. When we get tired <laughs> and think the troubles are too big, we can get, at least I get tremendous inspiration for her to just keep on going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker is Cindy Warmington. She's our executive counselor in District 2. Uh, she will share the governor's proclamation and a few remarks about democracy. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I met, um, Granny D, when I was uh, an officer with the Belknap County Dems, then we invited her to come and speak to the Dems. This was uh, long after her, her uh, famous walk. And um, the words that we've heard today um, that inspired all of us that day um, have been repeated by so many. Um, her commitment, her um, resolution, um, her energy, her inspiration, her passion. But one thing that hasn't been said yet, and I just have to say it, is that she had a wickedly funny sense of humor. I mean, she, she had the whole room in stitches and, um, and she had a way about her of getting to her, uh, her point, even with, you know, with such grace and with such humor. Um, and I think that served her so well and all of us. So um, I requested, um, uh, I, was, I was requested to ask the governor to issue a proclamation uh, in honor of Granny D. And um, I'm going to read that proclamation to you, which is um, signed by the governor. The state of New Hampshire by His Excellency Christopher T. Sununu, governor, a proclamation in the year of our Lord, 2022, 
Doris Granny D. Paddock Day, January 24th, 2022. Whereas Doris Granny D. Haddock was a citizen of Dublin, New Hampshire, who walked 3,200 miles across the United States between 1999 and 2000 to promote campaign finance reform, and whereas Granny D. recognized the importance of civic responsibility and encouraged people to practice their right to vote, and whereas she was politically active throughout her life and called for honesty, transparency, and equality in politics, and whereas she was known for being committed to her fellow citizens, for working to advance the ideals of democracy, and for her love of the state of New Hampshire, and whereas January 24th, 2022, would have been Granny D's 112th birthday, and it is a day to reflect on her contributions and accomplishments in support of campaign finance reform, now, therefore, I, Christopher T. Sununu, governor of the state of New Hampshire, do hereby proclaim January 24th, 2022, as Doris Granny D. Haddock Day in the state of New Hampshire, and call this to the attention of all citizens. And it is signed by Christopher T. Sununu. And I, I just want to say that Doris um, Haddock, Granny D., walked the walk, literally. And she calls on all of us to walk the walk every day. And, um, and I am thankful for having had the opportunity uh, to meet her. Thank you. Thank you. And we all wish we could be in executive council chambers um, cheering you on for doing <laughs> amazing work you do uh, to hold our government accountable. But I remember uh, her hundredth birthday being with her in the executive council chamber. So we all wish we had chocolate cake to share today's program. But we do have a special song. Um, but before our song, I'm asking Brian to read some remarks from Ruth Myers. Hi, everybody. Um, I uh, needed to give you a little backstory um, before I um, um, read what um, Ruth Meyer has given us. Ruth was a, a, a longtime friend, is a longtime friend of, of Granny D's. Uh, and also her, um, she calls herself Granny D's archivist. And um, she couldn't be here today. Um, and even though she really wanted to be, um, but she did send a couple of notes. Um, Dick Pollock was a uh, man who uh, was a part of the Open Democracy, Coalition for Open Democracy board um, back uh, several years ago. And he recently passed uh, back in, uh, I think uh, it was late 2016. Um, and um, that figures into the, uh, the note that we got from Ruth. And Ruth says, one day I was visiting Granny D and she read out loud to me a notice that she just received about Dick Pollock joining COD. This is what she said. Oh my God, Ruth, a COD, a haddock, and now a Pollock. People are going to think this is an awfully fishy group. And uh, so certainly that sense of humor that, uh, that uh, Councilor Wormington was just mentioning, um, very apparent. Uh, and her second anecdote, um, she says, on a drive from Dublin toward Keene, she asked that we pull aside to visit for a few minutes. And I, I, I think I know that route. And I think I know exactly where the spot was on this. She said, funny, people don't think they, uh, excuse me, people say they don't expect a thank you for some small gesture they'd made, nor an apology from me uh, for a slight that I might have shown. And at the end of that visit, she came up with these words. It is never too late to say a thank you. It is never too late to offer an apology. And it is never too late or never too often to say, I love you. Thank you, Brian, for sharing um, those important words uh, and memories from Ruth. And uh, speaking of the archives, if you ever are, find yourself in Keene at Keene State College at the Mason Library, her life is, is archived. And I was there doing some research, and I came ac across this envelope, and I said, huh, what is this manila envelope? I open it up, and I see communications between Sarah and Pete Seeker about the Ballard of Granny D. And we are honored to have um, 
Sarah share um, this song that she co-wrote with Pete Seeger about Granny D with us. Hi, everybody. And it's just, it's so heartwarming to hear these stories about Granny D, who was such a good friend to me. Um, I just want to tell you a word or two about how this song came about. Um, during 2000, you know, like around two, in 2020, 2021, I was copying and sending um, speeches that Doris was making to Pete Seeger. He didn't have access to the internet. And so I would, and he loved the speeches. So I was sending these speeches. And then one time as I was driving up from visiting family, uh, I stopped by in Beacon and I'm sitting there with him at the, at the table there. And um, he said, oh, I, I have a, a chorus to this song. And he takes a piece of scrap paper and he writes up this chorus. And then he says, I, I'm too old. You write the song. And he pushes the paper over to me. I was like, Pete, <laughs> I'm not a songwriter. He said, nah, you, I'm too old. You write it. And so I hop in the car and I'm driving from Beacon right back up to Boston. And these, somehow these stanzas started coming into my mind. And so when I got home, I jotted them down. And over a couple of days, there were a couple more. And finally, there were four stanzas. And I, I just sent them off to Pete. And I thought, well, maybe he'd get a charge out of seeing them. Well, two weeks later, I get a letter from Pete with a tune for the song. And a week or two after that, I get another letter with, oh, forget that other tune. It wasn't good enough. Here's a better tune. And so we were back and forth with the words. He changed them around a little bit. And uh, so we came up with the Ballad of Granny D. Well, long story short, which is why this song is sitting in the archive and nobody's ever seen it, is that the last letter I get from Pete about this song, um, which is in the printed version I had sent, says, Sarah, please don't print or record this song until it is improved. Neither the tune nor words are good enough. Granny deserves better. Pete. <laughs> so, so long story short, Pete wanted lots and lots of, of amazing songwriters to write lots and lots of songs about Granny D and the, the best would rise to the top. It's the folk process. And, you know, I, he thought that I knew lots of great folk singers. I didn't really know songwriters. I didn't really know any. But if any of you out there today like to write songs or know people who write to like to write songs, maybe there's a great Granny D song just waiting out there. And if you start writing it, I guarantee you, Pete will be smiling down on you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, we have one last uh, bit of the program. Um, but before, before we do that, uh, there's been a link in the chat. If you're interested in purchasing the Politics of Joy, um, you can click on that. And the other thing is her RV, her, her van that traveled across is being restored and is in our um, possessions now. So if you're interested in helping us restore Rosie, the van she traveled in to register women across this country, um, there'll be a link in the chat uh, to make a donation towards uh, restoring uh, yeah. Granny P's van. If you think you want to make a difference Something new ahead. Look at those eyes. Just you put one foot in front of the other, and you'll be doing just what Granny D has said. Whoa, whoa. If you want to get folks all together.
Well, may the world go, the world go, the world go. Well, may the world go when I'm far away. Well, may the skiers turn, the lovers burn, the swimmers learn. Peace, may the generals learn when I'm far away. Well, may the world go, the world go, the world go. Well, may the world go when I'm far away. Play the old hoedown dancer, swing round and round when I'm far away. Well, may the world go, the world go, the world go. Well, may the world go when I'm far away. Just a walk with Granny D. All the way to Washington, D. so much for joining us. I see Granny D's grandson. So thank you for sharing your Nana with us. I see members of uh, New Hampshire House Election Law. Thank you for the work you do to protect uh, voting rights and redistricting and getting money out of politics. I want to thank Hedrick Smith and John Bonifaz and um, Pat and Francis and Ruth and Nancy for sharing some, such a wonderful stories, other stories that were shared in the chat. Um, thank you all so much for being with us. And I guess Sarah, one more song we'll share, but if anyone needs to go, uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>